Yes, good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us for this webinar today. My name is Ron Manderscheid. I'm the Executive Director of the National Association of County Behavioral Health and Developmental Disability Directors. We're very delighted to be bringing you this second in a series of webinars on the relationship and intersection of epilepsy and psychiatric disorders. Uh, when we look at the epilepsy population, we learn that Anywhere from a third to a half of people in that population also have some type of psychiatric uh, disorder. Principally, this typically is either depression, anxiety, or one of the disorders in that series. And because of that, there's a need for work between the epilepsy field and the behavioral health field. And so we wanted to do this series of webinars to begin building partnerships between behavioral health and epilepsy. So we're delighted to have two speakers with us today who are going to talk to this issue. The first is Dr. Elaine Kiriakopoulos, a graduate of McMaster University Medical School in Canada, who began her postgraduate medical training as a resident in neurosurgery at the University of Toronto. She completed a research fellowship in magnetic resonance imaging and transcranial magnetic brain stimulation at Harvard University, studying cross-modal plasticity in the adult human brain. She subsequently completed her neurology residency in an epilepsy and clinical neurophysiology fellowship at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. She currently serves as the Director of Health Communications and Engagement at the National Epilepsy Foundation. And we've been delighted to work with Elaine on this series of webinars. Our principal speaker this afternoon is Dr. Andres Conner, who is a professor of clinical neurology and head of the Ep epilepsy section and director of the Comprehensive Epilepsy Center at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine which he joined on January 1st, 2013. Prior to coming to Miami, he was director of the Laboratory of Electroencephalography and Video EEG Telemetry and associate director of the epilepsy section of the Rush Epilepsy Center. Dr. Kanner has a longstanding research interest in the areas of pharmacology of epilepsy, psychiatric aspects of epilepsy, and surgical treatment of treatment-resistant focal epilepsy. He's the past editor-in-chief of Epilepsy Current, the official journal of the American Epilepsy Society. He has served as co-chair of the, of the Neuropsychobiology Commission of the International League Against Epilepsy and as the chair of the Epilepsy Section of the American Academy of Neurology. He has also chaired and has been a member of several committees of the American Epilepsy Society and the American Academy of Neurology. So we're very delighted to have both of these people joining us, and I'm going to turn it over to Elaine. Thank you, Dr. Manderscheid, and thank you to everyone who has joined us this afternoon. It's wonderful to be here with you today. If we could jump to the next slide, please, and the next slide. I would like to take a moment to share with everyone the mission of the Epilepsy Foundation. The Epilepsy Foundation aims to lead the fight to overcome the challenges of living with epilepsy and to accelerate therapies to stop seizures, find cures, and save lives. Next slide, please. Today's webinar is made possible through a cooperative grant from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Next slide, please. We're going to start today's webinar with a brief overview of seizures and epilepsy. Next slide, please. The human brain is a complex and dynamic structure that contains approximately 100 billion nerve cells called neurons. Neurons communicate with one another by sending and receiving electrical impulses and neurochemical signals. The electrical activity in the brain is usually carefully balanced. So normally a single neuron or a small group of neurons will send a signal to accomplish a task and then stop firing. A seizure occurs when abnormal and excessive electrical activity temporarily interrupts normal brain function. 
and you can see a visual of this in the, the image captured below from an electroencephalogram, an EEG, which records electrical activity in the brain, which you can see at the, at the very left-hand side of the photo is the brain activity at baseline, which suddenly becomes interrupted by excessive and abnormal electrical activity indicative of a seizure. It is important to recognize that every brain has the potential to seize. Individuals, however, do have different thresholds. We know that all human cerebral cortices have the potential to generate seizures if they are given enough of a stimulus. In fact, nearly 10% of people worldwide will have a seizure during their lifetime. It's also important to note the distinction between seizures and epilepsy. A seizure is an event. Not everyone who has a seizure has epilepsy. It's not uncommon for a seizure to occur in a situation where a person's seizure threshold has been lowered by, for example, a metabolic cause such as an abnormality in blood sugar or secondary to a toxic stimulus such as withdrawal from drugs or alcohol. Seizures can have many different outward signs, and the way a seizure appears depends on the type of seizure a person is experiencing and the area of brain involved. Next slide, please. So what does it mean for someone to have a diagnosis of epilepsy? The diagnosis of epilepsy indicates that a person is at increased risk for having recurrent, or more, seizures. More formally, the diagnosis of epilepsy is made when someone has two unprovoked seizures occurring greater than 24 hours apart, or if a person has one seizure with a high chance of having another. So if someone were to have one seizure and testing demonstrated an abnormality, for example, such as a structural lesion on brain imaging or abnormal brain waves on EEG, that person may still receive a diagnosis of epilepsy because of the likelihood or increased risk they have for recurrent seizures. The definition of epilepsy also includes that if a person has been diagnosed with a syndrome that includes seizures, even if they only have had one seizure, a person may still be diagnosed formally with epilepsy. Now, a diagnosis of epilepsy does not indicate the cause or the prognosis. Epilepsy can be described as a spectrum disorder, as it is multifactorial, multifaceted, and varies in severity from individual to individual. There are many different types of epilepsy. Next slide, please. Anyone can be affected by epilepsy, as it affects all ages, all races, and all socioeconomic groups. Children younger than age two and adults older than 65 are more likely to be diagnosed with epilepsy because of risk factors that are more common in these age groups. Next slide, please. Today's webinar will focus on the intersection of epilepsy and psychiatric disorders. There are currently approximately 3.4 million Americans who live with epilepsy. Between one quarter and one half of people living with epilepsy will also be diagnosed with a psychiatric comorbidity. The problem is both complex and common. I would like to take a moment to share with you the words of a few of these individuals. I drove two hours to come to this support group tonight. It is the closest one to where we live. It's my first one. I just needed to speak with other moms. My son is 11 and has been suspended from school five times in two years. Yesterday was number five. He has behavioral outbursts for no reason. We have seen behaviors at home too, but not as bad as at school. Yesterday, he threw his chair across the classroom. Thankfully, no one was seriously injured. We can't figure out what is happening with him. He can't tell us, we feel lost. He hasn't had a seizure for two months. I don't know if we can go through another medication change. He's on a waiting list for cognitive behavioral therapy. Alana, mom to Aiden, age 11. 
Next slide, please. I can't sleep. So yeah, I drink a bottle of wine every night. I come home from work wound up. I have a plumbing business and I can't drive myself to jobs. I have to hire a kid to drive me around. It's making the finances tight. I can't keep buying pills that don't work, so I take one instead of two in the morning. My wife is telling me she's going to leave. She can't handle the seizures, the money stress, and now the drinking. Paul, age 46, whose wife called in to the neurologist to report her husband had been rationing his medication to save money, drinking nightly, and having frequent generalized tonic-clonic seizures. Next slide, please. It wasn't on our radar. We were focused on the seizures and the tests for surgery and getting him through the surgery. He didn't tell us. He never wanted us to worry about him. He would be in the hospital having seizures recorded and wake up from a big seizure and say, Mom, are you okay? We spent the past year thinking he'll have the brain surgery and the seizures will stop. No one promised us that would happen, but is what we were all desperate for as a family. Esme, mom to Henry, who took his own life at age 24, seven months post-epilepsy surgery. Next slide, please. To help us better understand the complexities of the intersection of epilepsy and psychiatric disorders and the scope of the problem, we are so very fortunate to have Dr. Kanner with us today. And I'll turn the webinar over to Dr. Kanner to share his expertise and his insights. Dr. Kanner, thank you. Thank you very much, Elaine. It is a pleasure to be here uh, with all of you. Uh, what I'm going to try to do is give you an overview of how we approach the complex relationship between psychiatric disorders and epilepsy, which as you already heard, it is a common uh, problem and it affects the quality of life of every patient with epilepsy affected by a psychiatric comorbidity. So how big of a problem is it? You already heard that uh, 20 to 50% of people with epilepsy will have some kind of a psychiatric disorder. And this is some of the evidence. This is a population-based study done in Canada that compares the lifetime prevalence of psychiatric disorders in people with epilepsy compared to controls. Now, this is a population-based study, so this is quite representative of what happens in everybody uh, in the community, not only in epilepsy centers. And as you can see, one out of every three people with epilepsy will at some point experience a psychiatric, a psychiatric disorder in the course of their life in comparison to one out of every five people in the general population. The uh, mood and anxiety disorders are the most frequent comorbid psychiatric conditions that we see in people with epilepsy. And much of my uh, presentation will use these two uh, conditions as a model to uh, uh, bring the different concepts across. This is a, a prevalence rate of psychiatric disorders at any point in time. So these are not lifetime uh, rates. And when you look at it in, the, uh, in this fashion, you can again see that for all major psychiatric di disorders, depression, anxiety, psychosis, and attention deficit hyperactivity disorders, people with epilepsy have a significantly higher prevalence of these conditions than general population. And the ranges that you see are a reflection of the different type of studies that were used to uh, uh, make up this slide. And uh, it reflects different type of methodologies used to ascertain or identify psychiatric pathology. Now, what do psychiatric symptoms reflect? And it's important that we have a clear understanding of that because depending on the type of psychiatric symptom, the treatment will be different. We're going to use, again, depression and anxiety episodes as an example. So what kind of psychiatric uh, type of psychiatric symptom is it? 
The most often recognized is the intrictal psychiatric symptom, which is a symptom that occurs at any time independent of the timing of a seizure. Less frequently uh, identified are the psychiatric symptoms that are time-related with seizure occurrence. And those are symptoms that either precede the uh, seizure uh, by one to three days, that are the expression of the seizures, and this is what we call an ictal psychiatric symptom, or that occur following a psychiatric, uh, following a, a seizure, and this is what we refer to as postictal psychiatric symptoms. Interestingly enough, the postictal psychiatric symptoms does not necessarily occur immediately after a seizure, but there can be between one uh, day and five days between the last seizure and the beginning of the psychiatric symptoms. And those uh, peri-ictal symptoms are often not investigated by neurologists and go uh, um, uh, un, 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 uh, and are not in, in integrated into the evaluation. Interestingly enough, interictal symptoms are uh, associated with an increased likelihood that people may experience peri-ictal psychiatric symptoms. So it's not one or the other, but it's one and the other. And the other type of psychiatric symptoms is what we call iatogenic, which means those are uh, symptoms that are caused by the treatments we use to treat epilepsy, mainly with pharmacologic agents, medications, or with surgery. Now, the importance of recognizing whether a symptom is interictal, periictal, or iatrogenic is that the treatment obviously is going to be different. If it is interictal, the treatment may require medications for the psychiatric symptoms or psychotherapies. If it is a periictal phenomena, it will require the achievement of, of a seizure free state. And if it is an iatrogenic phenomena, then it will require that uh, we change the treatment uh, if we're talking about a pharmacologic uh, uh, agent that has caused the side effect. If the uh, uh, symptoms resulted from epilepsy surgery, then those uh, symptoms will need to be treated symptomatically. It is important that we recognize the complex uh, a relationship between psychiatric uh, disorders and epilepsy with respect to when they occur in time. So we often think of psychiatric comorbidity as being a consequence or a complication of the epilepsy, as illustrated in this slide. However, in a significant number of patients, psychiatric disorders can precede the onset of epilepsy, and these are often are uh, heralded by a positive family psychiatric history. In other words, people where there is family psychiatric history have an increased risk of developing a uh, psychiatric disorder, often before the onset of epilepsy, but it can also be associated with an increased risk of developing the psychiatric disorder after the onset of the epilepsy. A previous psychiatric disorder before the onset of epilepsy can recur after the onset of epilepsy and may be just a, uh, a reflection of the natural course of the psychiatric disorder. And this is not unusual in mood and anxiety disorders as well as in psychotic disorders, which can be lifetime conditions. And then finally, you can have a combination of previous psychiatric history and family psychiatric history as a risk factors for developing psychiatric conditions after the onset of epilepsy. And it is very important that when patients with epilepsy are being evaluated for their seizure disorder, that the neurologist has a clear picture of the psychiatric history of the patient, including an idea of the fact family psychiatric history, and you will see the reasons for that in a few minutes. Now, why should patients and providers care? 
The impact, for example, of depression and anxiety disorders on the life of patients with epilepsy is identified at multiple levels. The worst situation is that people with depression and anxiety episodes have an increased risk of committing suicide. In one study uh, done in Denmark, a person with epilepsy had a 32-fold higher risk of committing suicide compared to the general population. A history of anxiety disorder was associated with a 12-fold higher risk of committing suicide, and a history of schizophrenia had an 11-fold higher risk of committing uh, suicide. It also is associated with a premature death in people with epilepsy caused by external factors such as accidents or uh, overdoses uh, uh, from uh, medications in the form of a suicide uh, uh, attempt. People with depression and anxiety episodes can have a worse tolerance of antiepileptic medications. They can uh, therefore um, uh, be more likely to uh, not uh, uh, tolerate well the medication that they're given for the treatment of their epilepsy and they may require uh, a change in their antiepileptic uh, medication more frequently because of the report of side effects, when in fact what's driving this food tolerance is the presence of a mood and anxiety disorder. In addition, the presence of depression and anxiety episodes have been identified as the uh, variables most likely associated with a poor quality of life. And in fact, in people with intractable epilepsy, that is the epilepsy where people do not respond to medication, the presence of depression and anxiety is associated uh, with worse quality of life to a greater degree than the actual frequency and severity of seizures. In other words, people get accustomed to having seizures but if they are suffering from a concurrent depression and anxiety disorder, that will drive their quality of life uh, um, uh, worse and would interfere uh, with their daily activities more than the actual seizures. So therefore, identifying the presence of a mood and anxiety disorder is as important as the treatment of the seizures because it goes to the uh, uh, um, uh, making sure that we are improving the quality of life of our patients with epilepsy. Now, people who have a previous psychiatric history are at increased risk of having iatrogenic adverse events uh, when exposed to certain medications, and I will uh, elaborate on that in a couple of minutes. There have been uh, several studies that have shown that people who had a previous psychiatric history before the onset of epilepsy are less likely to become seizure-free than people who don't have that history. And what has been reported in uh, several studies is that if uh, a person has a history of uh, depression, for example, the likelihood of uh, uh, developing treatment-resistant epilepsy, that is that patients will not respond to medication, is twofold more frequent than that in uh, people without such history. This is a, uh, a statement that was uh, written 26 centuries ago by Hippocrates, which says melancholics ordinarily become epileptics and epileptics melancholics. What this means is if you have symptoms of depression, you're likely to develop epilepsy, and if you have epilepsy, you are more likely to develop depression. And he provides an explanation for this observation. 26 centuries later, this observation was confirmed in several studies that have shown that patients with epilepsy have a 5 to 24 higher risk of developing depression, but patients with depression have a 2 to 5 fold higher risk of developing epilepsy. So there is a bidirectional relation between the two conditions. What this suggests 
is that the uh, mechanisms in the brain that uh, mediate uh, the development of epilepsy and depression are common, and that's why the presence of one condition facilitates the other condition. But this bidirectional relationship is not only identified between epilepsy and depression, but has also been identified with other psychiatric disorders. So for example, a person with a prior psychiatric history of anxiety disorders has a 2.5-fold higher risk of developing epilepsy. If they've tried to commit suicide, those people have a 4.5 higher risk of, committing, of developing epilepsy. If they have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder of the inattentive type, those people have an increased risk of developing epilepsy by 3.5 fold. And if they have a psychotic history, they have a four to six fold higher risk of developing epilepsy. Why is this important to keep in mind? Because very often we treat patients with these psychiatric conditions with medications. And if these people were to develop a seizure in the course of their treatment of their attention deficit disorder or their depression or their anxiety disorders, we tend to automatically attribute the seizure to the uh, medication that is used for the treatment of these psychiatric conditions when in fact it has nothing to do with the use of that medication, and it's just a reflection of the natural course of the psychiatric disease that increases the risk of developing epilepsy. Now, in the case of uh, psychiatric disorders that occur independently of the seizures, which we call intrinsic episodes, they can be identical to the ones that we see in people without um, epilepsy. And in the case of depression, uh, they can present as major depressive disorder, which are the more severe forms of uh, the mood disorders, or they can present as a dysthymia, which is less severe but more chronic uh, form of depression that can go on for two years or they can present as manic depressive illness or bipolar disorders. One of the things that we see very often associated with a mood disorder is the presence of anxiety disorders. And in a certain percentage of patients, they can also have a personality disorder associated with a mood and anxiety disorder. So as you can appreciate, the psychiatric um, uh, pathology that we see in people with epilepsy can be uh, um, limited to one condition or to several psychiatric diagnoses, and the worst situation is when they're associated with a personality disorder. The iatrogenic psychiatric episodes, which are caused by uh, the treatments we use uh, for epilepsy, can be anticipated if we keep in mind the psychiatric profile of a patient. So th this is what I showed you before as the psychiatric profile. And we can see that those people who have a, a history of mood and anxiety disorder prior to the onset of epilepsy have an increased risk of developing iatrogenic symptoms after certain pharmacologic regimens or surgery. But this can also happen if they are having concurrent mood and anxiety disorders, or if they have a family psychiatric history. So it is important that when we choose an anti-epileptic medication, we have a clear uh, picture of the psychiatric antecedents of every patient in order to choose anti-epileptic medications that have positive psychotropic properties in people who have a previous psychiatric history or avoid antiepileptic medications that are known to have negative psychotropic properties that can facilitate the occurrence of psychiatric symptoms. And uh, in fact, the introduction of antiepileptic drugs with negative psychotropic properties uh, can cause the atrogenic psychiatric episode not in everybody, but in patients with a positive psychiatric history.
whereas the discontinuation of antiepileptic medication with positive psychotropic properties can result in the recurrence of psychiatric disorders that had been in remission because of the therapeutic effect of those antiepileptic drugs. And again, this happens in people with a previous psychiatric history. So this is a list of antiepileptic medications that can cause uh, psychiatric uh, symptoms in people with previous psychiatric history or current psychiatric history. Barbiturates, benzodiazepines, levetiracetam, topiramate, zonizamide, ligabatrine, thiagabine, and parampanil. Now, these are the, the antiepileptic medications that have positive psychotropic properties. That means that they have positive effects in the control of mood and anxiety symptoms, and their discontinuation in people with a prior history of these conditions can result in the recurrence of, that, of those psychiatric symptoms. Now, when we talk about the periictal episodes, those are the episodes that are time-related with the occurrence of seizures. A common example is what we call ictal panic that can frequently be confused with panic attacks. An ictal panic is a, con uh, a, 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 a form of simple partial seizure or aura that presents with a sensation of fear or panic, but it is different than a panic attack. A panic attack consists of a sensation of impending doom, whereas an ictal panic has a less intense quality in the fear uh, or the feeling of panic. A panic disorder often is associated with other forms of anxiety disorders, such as agoraphobia, that means a fear of being left alone or leaving the house, or general anxiety disorders, whereas ictal panic is associated with other symptoms that are typical of auras of uh, 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 seizures originating in the mesotemporal structures of the brain, such as symptoms of deja vu, epigastric discomfort, or excessive salivation. A very important uh, distinction is the duration. An ictal panic lasts less than 30 seconds. A panic attack lasts more than five minutes, and typically it can last between five minutes and 20 minutes. So that when you have a person who is reporting sensation of panic or fear, but that is lasting 15, 20 seconds, you need to suspect that these may actually be uh, an ictal panic and not a panic attack. Anticipatory anxiety is common in panic disorders, but not in ictal panic. Antidepressants work to prevent panic attacks, but do not have an impact on ictal panic. And uh, sleep deprived uh, uh, intrigual EEGs will often be normal in ictal panic because the structure of the brain that generates that ictal panic is a structure in the temporal lobe called the amygdala. And the amygdala is a structure that doesn't generate abnormal electrical activity with a large enough electric field that it can be detected on EEG recordings. And therefore, the confusion in the diagnosis is quite frequent. But if we follow the clinical manifestations and the clinical difference between the two disorders, we could uh, uh, um, uh, achieve a reliable diagnosis between the two conditions. Now, a type of psychiatric symptom that often is neglected by neurologists, but that can be quite scary to patients and families, are postictal psychiatric symptoms. As I said, these are symptoms that can occur between 12 hours and up to five days after a seizure, they usually are seen in people who have treatment-resistant epilepsy. So these are patients who've suffered from epilepsy for a few years. And this is uh, uh, data from a study that we were involved in, 
in 2004 of 100 consecutive people with treatment-resistant focal epilepsy. Of those 100 people, 43 people endorse habitual symptoms of depression after seizures during the three months prior, uh, before we did the study. So it was a habitual phenomenon. And uh, symptoms of suicidal ideation were seen in 13% of these people. Wow. Anxiety were seen in 45% uh, of these people. Psychotic symptoms such as delusions and hallucinations in 7%. Neurovegetative symptoms such as problems with appetite, sexual drive, and sleep in 62% of patients. Cognitive symptoms in 82% of patients. And cognitive without psychiatric symptoms were only seen in 14 patients. No, sub, no postictal symptoms were identified in 12 patients. So as you can see, the majority of patients experience psychiatric and cognitive symptoms. And it is important to recognize for the following reason. So this is a table with postictal symptoms of depression. And, I, and you can see in the first column, the frequency, and in the second column, the duration, you can appreciate that it, uh, uh, the, the, the mean duration is 24 hours. So you have to, you have to, to think, if you're having a, a, a symptom of depression that is, uh, of suicidal ideation that is lasting 24 hours, uh, what is worse, a seizure that occurs in uh, one or two minutes, or having the thought of how am I going to kill myself for a period of 24 hours or 36 hours. So, th so that is a clear example of how these symptoms can significantly affect the quality of life of the patients with epilepsy. So now, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in this uh, slide, I'm showing you the postictal symptoms of anxiety and the, the median duration of those symptoms, which, as you can appreciate, ranges between 6 hours and 24 hours. And you ask yourself, what is worse, a seizure that lasts one or two minutes or being anxious with panicky feelings for 24 hours? Again, important considerations when you are uh, uh, trying to understand how these psychiatric symptoms affect the quality of life of these patients. The problem is that postictal symptoms of depression and anxiety do not respond to antidepressant medication. Postictal psychotic symptoms do respond to medication. Uh, and uh, when people have postictal uh, symptoms of depression, we often will offer cognitive behavior therapy. Now, one of the concerns in the um, management of comorbid psychiatric disorders uh, has stemmed from misperceptions that antidepressant and psychotropic medications can worsen seizures. Is that a fact? Can you give me the next slide, please? In fact, Using antidepressant medications is safe in people with epilepsy. It is important to keep that point because the fear that antidepressant medications uh, can cause seizures uh, is based on observations in people who have seizures after taking overdoses. But when you use the medications at therapeutic doses, uh, you are uh, unlikely to have an epileptic seizure. And in fact, there are some studies that suggest that certain type of antidepressant medications can have a beneficial effect in a seizure frequency. This is a study that was done by a neuropsychiatrist from New York University who requested data from the FDA on the incidence of seizures associated with uh, uh, treatment with antidepressant medications uh, and placebo in randomized placebo control trials that were being done for uh, licensing. And what he found is that those people who were uh, 
uh, randomized to the drug had half the frequency of seizures compared to those that were randomized to placebo. So being exposed to placebo was associated with a higher frequency of seizures than uh, if you were given the antidepressant medication. And what this suggests is that, in fact, this was a reflection of what we talked about before. If you have a prior history of depression or anxiety, you have an increased risk of having seizures. And in fact, those people who were randomized to placebo had 19-fold higher uh, 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 risk of having seizures compared to the general population. Identifying patients with epilepsy and depression or anxiety disorder in the outpatient neurology clinic is very easy. We can use screening instruments that patients complete in the waiting room and uh, that uh, take three to five minutes to complete between the two instruments. The first instrument is the Neurologic Disorder Depression Inventory in Epilepsy, which is an, uh, a six-item instrument that patients complete depending on how they've been feeling for the previous two weeks. If, if the total score is greater than 15, this is suggestive that the person is experiencing a major depressive episode. And this is something that the neurologist can easily uh, use in the office and uh, refer the patient for treatment uh, or, or further evaluation uh, of this uh, suspected uh, depressive disorder. The screening instrument that we use for anxiety is the Journalist Anxiety Disorder 7. Uh, and this is a, 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 a seven-item instrument that also ask about uh, the occurrence of these items in the previous two weeks. And in here, if a score of, uh, of greater than 10 is obtained, the person is considered to be suffering from the generalist anxiety disorder. Because people with depression often suffer from anxiety, as I mentioned before, the use of these two instruments together in the office is very helpful in really identifying those people with epilepsy at risk of, of uh, having a comorbid mood and anxiety disorder. So what, do, what about the treatment? The treatment of psychiatric disorder is based on pharmacotherapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, or both. Let's, let's focus on the treatment for anxiety and depressive disorders because those are the most frequent type of conditions. So the aims of pharmacotherapy is to achieve a remission of all the symptoms of depression and anxiety. Sometimes we have to adjust the dose of the antidepressant medication in the presence of certain antiepileptic medications that are known as enzyme-inducing antiepileptic drugs because those medications accelerate the elimination of the antidepressant medications. And sometimes certain antidepressant medications can also interact with uh, the antiepileptic drugs, which require the adjustment of the, uh, of the dose of the antiepileptic medication. So in order to avoid this type of, uh, of adjustment, we uh, use antidepressant medications that have little pharmacokinetic interaction. And those are uh, antidepressants of the families of the serotonin uh, selectic reuptake inhibitors, which are the first choice. And these include citalopram, escitalopram, and sertraline because those have no interaction with the antiepileptic medications, although certain antiepileptic medications can accelerate their elimination. If a patient continues to be symptomatic after optimal trial within SSRI, we then uh, switch to a serotonin or pernerfine reuptake inhibitor, such as venlafaxin or duloxetine, and if that doesn't work, we can try an, another class of antidepressants such as mirtazapine. Now, when an individual has uh, exhibited uh, persistent symptoms after trials with two types of antidepressant medication, the likelihood is that that person suffers from a treatment-resistant mood disorder, and those patients need to be evaluated and treat treated by psychiatrists that have great expertise in this area. The good news is that among people with epilepsy, 
in my experience and that of others, the remission of symptoms is significantly better with medication and psychotherapy than in people without epilepsy. This is a, um, a paradoxical phenomenon that somebody with epilepsy and depression will respond better to antidepressant medication and psychotherapy than somebody who doesn't have epilepsy, but that is the fact. And they actually respond to lower doses of medication. So the points that they home are that in patients with epilepsy, mood and anxiety disorders are relatively frequent psychiatric comorbidities. They can cause serious negative uh, impacts on the management of the seizure disorder and the life of these patients at several levels such as worse seizure control, worse tolerance of antiepileptic drugs, increased suicidal risk, and worse quality of life. And these conditions can be safely treated with antipressants of the families of the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, which are the drugs that are typically used in the treatment of these conditions. Okay, I'm gonna stop here. I appreciate your attention. I'm gonna turn over the microphone to Elaine. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Dr. Kanner. So this brings us to the final part of today's webinar. Um, before the question answer period, we do have time for questions and answers at the end. Dr. Kanner will help us with that. So you can type in any questions you want in the webinar question panel on the right-hand side of your screen uh, leading up to that. But we wanted to share with you uh, today that there are a number of resources you can turn to after today's session to continue learning about epilepsies. Resources both for providers and patients are numerous. And I'll just highlight a few of these uh, resources uh, for providers to begin with. So the Epilepsy Foundation uh, has information available for professionals both online at epilepsy.com and through our 24-7 helpline as well. There are also resources that um, you can access through the foundation to be able to share with your patients. Uh, information on everything from seizure first aid to specific medications uh, to different types of treatment in epilepsy to um, day-to-day -day living advice for people living with epilepsy or patients that you see. Um, so be sure to reach out to the foundation. There are a number of uh, resources available for professionals as well through the Centers for Disease Control, the American Epilepsy Society, the National Association of Epilepsy Centers, the American Academy of Neurology, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and through the Veterans Affairs Epilepsy Centers of Excellence. If you're seeing a patient in your clinic and they have not been connected with uh, a provider to help them care for their epilepsy, if you go to the National Association of Epilepsy Centers website, you can look to see uh, where the closest epilepsy center is uh, to your location to help that person find the help they need. I also want to take a moment to share with you uh, the self-management programs in epilepsy that as mental and behavioral health providers, you can share with your patients. And for any individuals living with epilepsy who have joined us on the webinar today, I'd like to share you can access more information about these programs online by calling the Epilepsy Foundation helpline or by reaching out to your local Epilepsy Foundation office. So since 2007, the CDC Managing Epilepsy Well Network has provided national leadership in developing and testing and disseminating innovative self-management programs, tools, and trainings for professionals to help people with epilepsy better manage their disorder and enhance their quality of life. National and local organizations, federal agencies, healthcare organizations, and people living with epilepsy all participate in the network comprising a wide range of clinical, public health, social service, and personal expertise. This expertise has led the network to develop evidence-based programs that people with epilepsy can use in their homes, at their doctor's offices, or in the community setting. Some of these programs are made available through the telephone, others via personal computer uh, or other electronic devices, and this is important because it helps to eliminate barriers to care, such as lack of access to transportation, 
any functional limitations, and the stigma that many people with epilepsy face when seeking care. A number of these programs, for as one for example is the Uplift program, aims to empower people with epilepsy to manage and improve their mental health and quality of life. So take time uh, to read about these programs online or to call the foundation for more information. I also want to share with you today some of the other resources that you can provide to patients and families uh, to support them in managing their epilepsy and to help guide them on their journey to reaching their best health. Next slide, please. So you'll see again listed our Epilepsy Foundation contact information. So there is online on epilepsy.com not only information for professionals, but there's a wealth of information uh, for, for individuals and families to access so they can learn about epilepsy, they can uh, learn about living with epilepsy, and they can learn about connecting with other individuals and families impacted by epilepsy. Similarly, there's information directed at the general public and for individuals and families living with epilepsy to educate them at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention website, uh, at the National Association of Epilepsy Center website through the Child Neurology Foundation, again through the Veterans Affairs Epilepsy Centers of Excellence and through the National Institute of Mental Health Disorders. Finally, we hope that from today's learning with Dr. Kanner, you will take away a better understanding of the need for neurologists, behavioral health providers, and community supports to work together. Epilepsy is a common problem. The intermingling of epilepsy and psychiatric disease is also common. Patients can face hurdles in diagnosis, referral, and treatment that have a negative impact on their wellness and increase their risk for morbidity and mortality. Oftentimes, the path that a patient follows on their epilepsy journey can be so filled with twists and turns that people are left with more questions than answers. We hope that by working together to bridge the fields of epilepsy and behavioral health, and by looking for points along any individual's epilepsy journey where we can intervene to ensure they get the appropriate referrals they need to behavioral health providers who have a good understanding of the challenges epilepsy can bring, that together we'll be able to limit the negative impacts on quality of life and improve health outcomes by lowering risks. I would like to thank Dr. Manderscheid for supporting and guiding our work and for giving us the opportunity to present this webinar today. I would also like to thank all of you for your interest and attention. We hope you will join us in the future as we continue to share with you regular webinar learning sessions that are focused on the intersection of epilepsy and mental and behavioral health. I would also like to offer special thanks to Dr. Kanner for sharing his time and his incredible wealth of knowledge and experience with us this afternoon, and for his steadfast support of the Epilepsy Foundation and the epilepsy community at large. Dr. Kanner, thanks so very much, and I hope that you'll stick with us a little bit longer to take some questions from this group. Sure, of course. So I'd like to add my thanks, it's Dr. Manderscheid again, I'd like to add my thanks to Elaine's, to Dr. Kanner for an absolutely excellent presentation. And let me kick off with a couple of questions here. So one of the things that struck me in your presentation is the relatively high percentage of people with epilepsy who are suicidal. But we also know that if a person has depression and they take SSRIs, SSRIs in and of themselves can increase the likelihood of suicidal behavior. So could you comment on that? Yeah, so, so this is, uh, thank you for asking this question, uh, because this is a question that often um, uh, preoccupies many patients um, uh, when it is offered to them for the treatment of their mood disorders. The association between suicidality and SSRIs has been uh, uh, made in children, not in adults uh, with depression. And uh, the data that has been uh, uh, presented by the FDA uh, uh, 
which reported the increased uh, suicidal risk of children and adolescents um, or for having suicidal ideation has to be taken uh, with a uh, with certain uh, uh, care uh, because uh, obviously when when this uh, uh, observation was published there was a drop in the prescription by many child psychiatrists in uh, the use of these medications and this was followed by a spike of suicides among pe pediatric patients with depression so how do you how do you uh, deal with this situation when you start a person with an antidepressant medication? You basically have to educate the patient and family members as to the potential for uh, increased suicidal ideation. That risk is low; it's very low; it's not high. But if there were to be any symptoms, then they need to alert the psychiatrist who can then discontinue the medication or switch to another medication. But I don't think that this uh, uh, association should in any way uh, be a reason not to treat uh, comorbid depression and anxiety disorder. And in adults, we don't see that association. So again, thank you very, very much for a wonderful webinar. We will make this uh, recording of the webinar available to everybody that is on and also my other members of the National Association of County Behavioral Health and Developmental Disability Directors and also my members from the National Association for Rural Mental Health. Just a note to those of you who are still on, we do plan other webinars in this series, so look for those webinars as we put them together. I thought today's webinar was very, very informative and would be very useful to a behavioral health provider who's trying to understand how to work with a person who has epilepsy and comorbid behavioral health conditions. So again, thanks very much to Dr. Kanner and thanks very much to Dr. Kariopoulos. So thank you all very much for joining us and we'll see you next time. Thank you.